Welcome back to Thinking Through Photographs in 2021. Um, my name is Liz Park. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm the curator at UV Art Galleries, one of the co-organizers of the series. And um, we are joined by other members of our team. I'll do a quick round of introductions. Um, we have David Oresek from Silver Eye, Kate Kelly, also from Silver Eye, Leo Sue from Silver Eye, Emily Reynolds from UB Art Galleries, and we have a new member of our team who is Maria Barrientos. Um, she is an artist and an MFA candidate at UB, and she'll be our graduate assistant this spring semester. For those of you who were with us last semester, um, she'll be taking over what Jillian did. Uh, so um, you'll be getting her emails uh, reminding you of the next session sending you readings and um, uh, sending you the, the link. So uh, you'll be hearing from Maria. <laughs> All right, so before launching into our discussion and handing it over to our facilitators, I want to begin with the acknowledgement that the land I am on and the land on which the University at Buffalo Art Galleries operates is the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy comprised of the Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations. Today, this region is still the home of the Haudenosaunee people, and I am grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory, and I'm committed to the very difficult and ongoing work of decolonizing our minds first and foremost, and hope that today's discussion serves as an opportunity to really question the assumptions of colonial settler societies and institutions in which we participate. Well, so today's uh, topic is unlearning photographs. Um, and we read two short texts by Ariella Azule, Unlearning the Origins of Photography and Unlearning Images of Destruction, which were actually published in a blog in 2018 in advance of her 2019 publication um, um, uh, potential history, unlearning imperialism. And I took these two short texts as a critical provocation for us to sort of reconceptualize what the medium and the technology um, is and as an active agent in uh, world making or world destruction to use her terms. And we also read Thomas Keenan's text, Counter Forensics and Photography, which um, revisits one of the readings that we did in the fall, Alan Secula's, well, actually, it's one among uh, many readings that he talks about the body of the archive. Um, and Keenan calls for a forum in which the meaning of a photograph must be fought for. Um, and it seems that that's our challenge today to let unlearn photographs, um, but in order to um, uh, truly unlearn to know where we're going, uh, maybe it should be coupled with how we relearn or how to re-imbue meaning and significance to an image. Um, and I also wanna share that um, I received a very kind email from none other than Thomas Keenan himself yesterday, because um, I, I know Tom. Um, he said, one of you, one of the participants actually emailed him and let him know about the series and forwarded him uh, the event. So uh, he sent a very gracious and appreciative message thanking us for engaging with his work. Um, and he also shared a new undergrad and master's program that he's starting at Bard College where he teaches. And um, I am actually going to drop in this link to a fellowship opportunity because I figure if you are here, you must be interested in an opportunity like this or know of people who would be. It's a master's program in human rights and the arts. Um, and the program aims to mm -hmm. develop new generations of practitioners and scholars who are critically engaged with human rights discourse and pra practice and the, uh, the power of artistic and creative practices. So um, with that uh, quick announcement <laughs> today uh, to help lead our discussion. We have two fantastic facilitators, uh, Yola Monikoff Stockton and Jared Thorne. Um, Yola uh, is 
an artist, educator, working in photography, works on paper, time-based installation and documentary-based practice. Her areas of inquiry include just cities, the environment, folklore, and decolonization against backgrounds of storytelling, technology, and archival studies. Her work engages forms of collaboration with institutions, scientists, literature, and cultural networks. She directs the photography program at SUNY Buffalo State, where she's assistant professor. And I must also add that Yola has been to every single one of Thinking Through Photographs in the fall. So I'm so happy that um, she joins us this time as a facilitator. And Jared Thorne uh, holds a BA in English Literature from Dartmouth College and Masters in Fine Arts from uh, Columbia University. His work speaks to issues of identity and subjectivity as it relates to class and race in America and abroad. He is an assistant professor in the art department at the Ohio State University and before joining OSU, Jared taught at the uh, collegiate level in South Africa from 2010 to 2015. And even though the two of them have distinct practices as individual artists, I actually first encountered their work as collaborators last summer in Buffalo as part of a public art installation series called Playground that Emily was one of the co-organizers for um, in, in around Buffalo. Yola and Jared presented a project titled Redlining in Buffalo, which uh, was an incredible project involving outdoor photo installation, sound, maps, and online resources that um, really dug into the structural ways in which the city divides itself along class and race lines. Um, it was one of the most memorable projects I've seen in Buffalo, I must say, since uh, coming here um, uh, in 2019. And I will also drop in the, the link to that project because I feel like everyone should know about this. Um, and you know, I actually must say, I'm, you know, they will you know, talk about this project, I hope. Um, but uh, when I saw some of the images that were presented almost in uh, an evidentiary way, like I actually thought of Thomas Keenan's text um, and uh, the way that um, their meaning should be grappled with and um, you know, the, its uh, significance should be um, uh, you have to make a case for it as though in a, in a court of law. Um, I thought their uh, photographs um, were presented in a way that uh, did not take for granted its meaning. Um, and it's also a project that is very deeply aligned with Azule's uh, provocation to unlearn imperialism. So I'm very pleased that the two of them will be leading this discussion. And as all of you know, they will um, uh, sort of walk us through some of the thoughts that they have had on the two texts, three texts. And um, we encourage all of you to chime in uh, when we are ready to discuss. Um, please feel free to use the chat function to type in and um, we will make sure to go through all of your comments and questions and really open it up for a conversation. So without further ado, Yola and Jared. Thank you, Liz, for that lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you also to David and Liz for organizing this series. It's been a pleasure to be a part of it. And it's, uh, so it's been really stimulating. And I'm really grateful for your bringing this conversation and creating the community around it. Um, I, I guess I will um, share my screen and I'll sort of hear the um, presentation and then uh, Jared and I um, will will both uh, be speaking to it. So just give me a sec, please. All right, I'll share my screen. And all right, can everybody see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so th thank you for, um, I guess maybe I'll, uh, if Jared, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, just move the cursor so Oh they yeah, thank you. Oh, you're right that, okay, got it, perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, so 
we yeah uh, i'll i'll go to to the first slide but uh liz thank you for uh, you know sort of thinking about our project in in the, or our our you know practice as 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 it's you know developing uh at the present moment in relationship to this azulai essay i actually had um you know, kind of been following her work for a little bit and uh, uh, was interested in some of the ideas in the civil contract of photography, which maybe we'll uh, uh, t touch upon today also. But but in this particular text uh, that we were asked to read, the big, you know, the big idea that she puts forward almost as a mind experiment or our challenge to us that we'll be addressing is this notion of, um, imagine uh, asking us to imagine that the origins of photography go back um, to 1492 right so so what is she, what does she mean is she she's saying like how you know how um, is photography implicated it, you know how is the discursive practice implicated in the traffic of photographs which we'll allude to you know through, throughout our presentation um, how is that related to the practice of imperialism and colonization in and of itself um, Jared maybe you want to say a couple of words before we jump yeah. into our images yeah I, I thought it was a uh... It was interesting doing the reading and then uh, collaborating on the talk or the presentation. Uh, I think one, because before collaborating with Yola on our project, I do kind of things kind of fiercely independent. Um, and I think the first thing that we talked about when we met or over Zoom a week or so ago to talk about it was that we obviously agreed with what Azule's premise was. But as makers, we found it a bit stifling. And it was just like, well, then what can you do? And, you know, and, and I think sometimes I, that kind of is my thought with theory. And I always tell students sometimes you got to just throw away the stuff that doesn't work and just keep the moments that really feed your practice. And so I think there is some of that, like it's tough, you know, I think she makes these really brilliant, compelling arguments. But I sometimes I get anxious about like, how does it relate to going out and photographing? Mm -hmm. And even like, yeah, I think there's a related thing, which is there's a call to deal with institutions and to rethink archives, all kinds of archives, you know, the, to contest the meaning of those archives. But then, you know, maybe one of the things that's more less clear and that we can talk about, you know, uh, uh, as we get into discussion is what does it mean for the production of new imagery? Like what, it, you know, what is a, a decolonial form of photography? Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, yeah, so so as 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 we were uh, kind of laying this out, one of the thoughts that emerged, and sorry, I need to find my advance button. Um, one of the thoughts that that emerged was that perhaps you know, in in the current artistic practice, there's a range of responses that we can see. Uh, among um, artists to how to engage with with the image um, like like you know so here there's um, a, a recent work by artist Stephanie Siyuko, um and the, the project is called diversity pictures I have I was able to see this exhibition recently but um, but uh, and, and and to hear her talk but she was um, uh, speaking about li like um, uh, the relationship between text and captions. Um, so here it's, it's, I'll read it, it says top view of mixed race business team, you know, it's awkward language, sitting at the table at loft office and working, woman manager brings the document. And it's, you know, it, it's like, um, Oh, it's, it's called ecphrasis, you know, picturing a, how, how is an image described in the words and how are the words awkward and when it's a stock photography of manufactured kind of like business friendly ideas about harmony of the races, right? So, so this is what um, she's dealing with here. And um, Jared, if you want to take, um, you know, this one. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Think so. I think we, it's interesting though, because I think 
it, once again, it's just like, well, what can you do? And I think she does an, like an amazing job speaking to that, like the problematics of the image. Mm -hmm. um, and I think someone like Paul Sapuya does this amazing job of, of like confronting, um, confronting the viewer like with his body, uh, with his relationships, uh, with himself, with others. Um, the idea, it feels like uh, the camera uh, less as weapon to, to colonize, but more of expression. And I think it, this is like, I think more along the lines of the things that kind of excite us about contemporary mm -hmm. photography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and so then in it, with this idea of the spectrum of responses, um, we were thinking about, you know, that, that uh, maybe one way to think about it is, is the spectrum is between work that engages us in this notion of the traffic in photographs and media critique on the one hand, or what um, you know Liz introduced so nicely, this like Thomas Keenan's idea of, of the contested space of the contested meaning of the photograph is a certain kind of new kind of humanism uh, or, or new, new approach to humanism, which has somehow been like an un unfashionable word uh, lately. Um, but so we have this quote here um, from Thomas Keenan, in which he writes, um, so photography, thanks to its trace structure, its incapacity for abstraction, takes a paradoxical but necessary turn in the direction of another abstraction, that of humanism, but this time rethought and repracticed as political struggle, as human rights advocacy, you know, so connecting to things um, that were said before. So the way um, I was sort of thinking about this is this idea of um, looking at photographs, how, how both archival photographs, or maybe like a very kind of democratic notion of archival photographs, evidentiary photographs, documentary photographs, photojournalism, like how does it, uh, how does it talk back? How do they talk back? And how do they pr uh, uh, create a certain kind of prompt uh, that then uh, uh, carries with it a forward momentum. Um, and we had several pictures we wanted to share um, from, yeah, from this. I, I think there's a way to, to, I think it feels like a call to action. Um, and so obviously in, in this photograph here, when, you know, Alton Sterling is, you know, murdered by the police, and you see this woman who's just beyond dignified and it feels like she's floating and like the, the cops are there to arrest her for, you know, her peaceful right to protest. It, and it says something, it says this thing where it's like, even though these brutalities are happening to us, that like we can respond via photograph. So we can, we can respond via action and we can photograph that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is like a really just salient example of that and I think this image sticks with me um, out of all the ways I feel like uh, people who protest are depicted um, that this one just stands out. And why is that? That's a good question. I mean, I think it's <laughs> it's it's like grace under fire, right? It's just that idea where um, it were, <laughs> it's funny how it gets back some ways to uh, some of the Frederick Doug stuff that we'll talk about, but it's like these ways in which they depict blackness and the way they depict, um, uh, you know, uh, those who, who yeah, ha have the audacity to say something uh, to authority. And with that, you know, I think just the whole time, it's her demeanor, you know, it's like she's like in a, a surgeon who's about to, you know, cut open a scalp, you know, cut open a scalp, but she, instead that she's just there and they're there and like, and then they're military, right? These, these are the Gestapo, you know? And, they're, and it's just like, she's just like, no. And I think it like makes everyone else calm. And I, but it's like distilled within the image and we can see that. And I can, that's funny, this is like on literally like I, we have little posters that we use for uh, our classes. And this is like on the cover for my like documentary class, like mm -hmm. stories, like what are the stories you want to tell? Like I'm interested in her story. I'm interested in these nuanced like portrayals, uh, por portrayals of, uh, of life, of protests, of response. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's why maybe there's this little moment um you know of course of the dress 
And, yeah. uh, you know, in Russian literature, I come from, I have a background in Russian literature, but there's so much emphasis on how is the environment in sync with a, the a part of the story and telling the stories of the characters and somehow like the wind, that the wind is catching her dress, like against the magic, you know, the magic and the spirit against the, the like the fierceness and the violence, you know, so uh, yeah, the, 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 and that's maybe something about visuality too, like these kinds of things, like if you reported it na in narrative terms, it wouldn't have that, but it was, it's this, oh, that there's something, um, you know that 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 it's a gestalt. This thing is happening and ca carries this grace with it, and 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 it gives us this emotional um, reaction. And then, so Jared, what what about this? What what would you say to this? Well, I, you know, it's a uh, it's another way of like bearing witness, right? It, of to uh, just uh, I guess like the like what we've become. It's like what we always are though, right? It's like, it, I, I, uh, I was actually having a discussion, this has been an aside, I was having a discussion about all the, like the Christian symbolism in so many of these images. Mm -hmm. And we, we were talking about how in the same way, it's, it, it's offensive to talk about like radical Islam because Islam is inherently radical. It's like, but the same way, like this is like radical Christianity because Christianity does, isn't this crap that they're doing over here, isn't white supremacy, isn't, um, you know, people it, trying to, you know, start a coup, but they like gussy it up and they try to, they try to, you know, wrap themselves in, in these things. And then it, and it really becomes like this radical Christianity that's trying to take over America. Um, anyway, that's, the, so, I, but it's great. It's like these images I think are there to like preserve the present. And it's the same way in which they, they, they want to depict uh, uh, protesters as, you know, fiery breath and, you know, we, you know wielding, you know, spears and, and you know, pitches of fire. It's like, no, what they are doing, they're, they're yielding crosses and they, they have American flags. And I think it's a really a way to, to unlearn and really learn again like, like what, what these movements are really about. And like why the police are not here, or they are, but they are in small numbers. But one woman with grace is there trying, trying to really speak to how this man was brutalized but, and killed by the police and you know, how she's treated versus this. And I think that's interesting. What do you think, y'all? Yeah, I like that. Oh, sorry, I was I was moving forward. I like uh, I, I like can. I like what you said. Um, I mean, I, I'll just maybe make a, an adjacent note. Um, you know, because we're talking about decolonizing, that there was an article in the Times, New York Times today, about classics, about a classics professor at Princeton who's uh, uh, you know in, in in the midst of a controversy about uh, how to read think you know kind of like speaking more openly about sla the institution of slavery and greek and roman uh life you know the the birth the birthplace supposedly of democracy and also um you know like 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 asking us to rethink how images of of uh, you know cl the classical world have been wielded you know by by white supremacists but yeah it, it, it I mean I don't know if this photograph for me uh, specifically does does it as much but I, and I mean sorry that we didn't find you know pictures that that speak to that but I think this has been a kind of like the last I don't know a couple of years and spe especially the last year has been this kind of time of, of rethinking like all of you know today I was showing still life um, like like a photographic interpretation of northern European still life uh, to my students and like like all of these values that we carry that you know that that like we carry as cultural values and how we assign a hierarchical status to them like you know this is a time to rethink the uh the nature uh, of those values so yeah i find that very interesting even like how the status of certain images changes you know the, the, perhaps this is the thomas keenan point so um jared do you mind taking this quote 
Yeah, my <laughs> proposition, however, is that photography did not initiate a new world, yet it was built upon and benefited from the imperial looting, divisions, and rights that were operative in the colonization of the world in which photography was assigned the role of documenting, recording, or contemplating what is already there. Um, yeah, I, I will say just because of time, I'd say we should show the image. And so, right, so this is where she's, it's like really, uh, like this is the birthplace of photography, right? This idea, uh, I think this is Francis Frith and this idea that these are things that are out there and you too can have like, um, yeah, that you too must own this. You know, I think about the manifest destiny. I think about the idea, you know, of America, right, right, right. We have Moybridge over here. Um, and this idea of Teddy Roosevelt and the West and how it's ours and it's there to be tamed. And I think really the things that, that Azule is saying is just spot on. Mm -hmm. um, but Yolo, yeah, what, what are your thoughts? Well, um, yeah, I, I, the, one of the things that I think really hit, hit me in, in those short readings was this idea that, uh, oh. that, that things are given to the gaze like for to looking for and I used to be a you know photojournalist in a previous life uh but I know that when I was you know young and and in that capacity I took it as a given that like oh here my photographic gaze should you know like envelop the world and like it's all there for you and I do find that that in a uh, notion of that like not all things are for looking for to be uh really powerful you know and I think it can cut both ways as a like we were saying earlier as a prohibition to yeah. making but also as a kind of powerful concept about um sacred spaces or li like you know limits of seeing or the value of invisibility um but here i had this is an archival image that uh i, I i've done some work in, in um at the state archive of hawaii and um, the, the, I think this is a kind of photograph that also really speaks to what Azule is saying, where um, the, this kind of notion of identity um, is being con constructed as a consumer product and experience. Uh, you know, the, the, here uh, the notion of Hawaiian identity. And, and I would also add that these women might, like oftentimes the women who played this role of the hula dancer were not even ethnically Hawaiian. They were um, like oftentimes Filipino or like, you know, from other immigrant groups. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the, this constructedness uh, of, of the medium, I think it, it like, it, it can can you know very strongly support uh, Azule's argument, but but like so, Jared here, I think I think we thought um, there was something different that was happening. Yeah, I I find yeah I find this image just really powerful, and then once again it comes like that juxtaposition where you don't well, you know like who has the rights to this image? Is it Harvard? Is it this you know person's relatives? But I know as it serves for me, like this was the first time I ever saw like a slave, and I was just like, oh wow! And it's like yeah, it's something penetrating. I feel like I saw like a like a resilience, and I think you know I think we're often told that uh, you know like this there's a and a lethargic and I don't know like an ineptitude. And I feel like when I saw this man, I was like, I saw someone who was like strong, who could like withstand the things that like I now benefit from that I know I couldn't withstand, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. And it is something really powerful. And, and with Fenty, is isn't it? With Fenty and mm -hmm. this image. Um, yeah, and I think it kind of usurps like a certain way in which slavery and blacks were depicted. But I don't know, if, like was it, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I know it complicates it. Mm. Um, the in, in case people don't know this photograph, uh, and we didn't read the chapter in which Azule deals with this, but this this is a daguerreotype print whose uh, ownership is being contested between the Harvard Peabody Museum and the family that claims uh, uh, to be descended from this this 
person uh, whose, whose name is Renzi. Uh, um, but uh, what I found also really interesting with this kind of uh, ar archival turn is that, you know, when you read about it, there's all this conversation uh, that you sometimes see about preservation, caring properly for this daguerreotype, it's so valuable. And then, um, and, and, and you see this kind of horrible contrast between the idea of like caring for this image as, as um, a, a piece of cultural heritage and this like caring, caring for the body and the human being uh, that you, or, you know, or lack thereof that you see in the photograph. Um, yeah, so that kind of continued life or uh, a new meaning of photographs in relationship to their subjects, I think is one, one of the interesting questions. I know, I think we're almost out of time. How are we doing with time? We're probably close. I will say one thing as it relates to the, uh, the Fenty image. I mm -hmm. think it relates to Azalea is that I think it's like when she talks about the idea of uh, how like these aren't slaves, these are people who were, you know, captured, uh, and, you know, and taken across waters and like there's a whole history essentially to the image and like what we're seeing and I feel like I get that when I see that image mm -hmm. you know I, I don't see that as someone who just worked on a farm no it's like this bigger thing that's happening that's happened to him that happened to millions of others and it, there's a like I said there's a strength but we we, we should move on because mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. um That'll be one of our questions later, like the role of the body and the representation of the body. Um, so Frederick Douglass, I think you, you started saying something about Frederick Douglass earlier. Yeah, well, I think this gets to like the power mm -hmm. of photography. And so like, who's the photo most photographed person in the 19th century? It it's my man Frederick. And he's just like, why? And he's like, yeah, because I need to dispel these rumors, you know? And he's just like, yeah, look at it. It's a, it's a sexy man. And he's like, yeah. I and mean, you need to see all of this, right? It's like Rihanna, or so, it's just something like ferocious and he like, demands to be seen. Hmm. And it like that, I don't know, I find that exciting. But and then I'm like, is that, I don't know, is that problematic? I don't know, but I, I know that I'm like, yeah, let's see Frederick and like, but also obviously he holds on to this notion of photography is truth that we hmm. know now that it's, it's complicated, but hmm. you know, yeah, just, I don't know if you had anything else you want. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, there was just a, a, a little insight that I read somewhere, I don't even remember where, but that he um, really, he loved photography because he thought that it presented him free of caricature. You know, like now we so often, of course, talk about photography's constructedness, but that he was like here, but of course, like on one hand, it's free of caricature. On the other hand, and this is an idea I'm interested in too, like this kind of talking back idea is like, well, he controlled it. He controlled his representation. And uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this, but I wanted to draw a related and perhaps lesser known um, example of the last queen of Hawaii, Queen um, Lilio Kalani, who was raised like very much in a hybrid tradition between Hawaiian culture and settler culture. Um, but who I think also, you know, as I've been uh, working with uh, our archival images, I, I, I realized, oh, you know, seems to really be deliberately using photographs to promote this idea of Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian unity, Hawaiian rights. And, and in this particular photograph, um, she signed, she was photographed earlier, but one year before her death, she's sort of signing it and distributing it, you know, so, so again, traffic like this traffic in uh, in photographs um but from an, an empowered perspective of saying like i know this has meaning and will inspire you and in fact it does continue to inspire activists uh today um so i don't know maybe i don't know if we want to um well wrap wrap it up the the this was a um a, a kind of a a, a contemporary project that I find really 
uh, wonderful and interesting that that explores vernacular photography. This is, um, uh, I'm sure many of you know, Renata Shirley's Black Archive. So this is one image from uh, the website, but I found the parallel. I know we had some slightly di different views on the use of the chair, but this uh, uh, somewhat regal pose um, uh, uh, in, in, in a, a photograph taken from a high school high school yearbook, um, really interesting. And, and I thought also maybe was it because, because Liz mentioned, you know, the kind of multidimensional pro uh, properties of our redlining Buffalo project, I wanted to accentuate the use of text and the use of context as part of the conversation, like this kind of idea of how do you like, how do you fight the fight for the meaning of the image, which can be read, you know, a, in a certain way, or it can be read against the grain. And and here, um, you know, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I clicked on it, but but the the accompanying poem, its place in a yearbook, like the whole its its existence on this archive that has gar uh, garnered so much interest. I think like all of that all ad adds to this kind of honorific idea of of these pictures being very uh, uh, powerful cultural documents. Yeah, just on the super of the quickest ideas because the time is of the essence. Uh, I, I found it really <laughs> engaging or interesting because that chair that-, that mm, I think Oh, sorry, on, I'll go back to it. It's like, I always said like, I don't, you know, I can't see most of anyone really who's on here, but like, if you're like black of a certain age, that's like the black people's chair. Like I was saying, whether that's the uh, Selassie I or whether it be like the Black Panthers, like in the seventies, it's like my parents had that chair. You don't still have it, but like it conjured up these these feelings, um, and so yeah, I don't know. I got excited. I was like, oh yeah, that's the like the black people's chair. I know that. Anyway, but we should go to the next one because we got to end because we got to wrap it up. Yeah, totally. yeah. Uh, but in the same example, we're just talking about uh, like photographs and images that if we were to unlearn and relearn, I think uh, present uh, the body in ways that are kind of decolonized. It just I always think of. Carrie Mae Williams' dinner table series where one presents the self and like all the nuances and complexities of the self. Um, and it's, you know, by her own hand, I believe in one of them, she even shows she has the uh, the cable release cord, not in the ones we have here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just, it just, I remember like for me, this is, once I, I thought photo, I thought photography was essentially documentary work. And then in undergrad, I saw this and I was like, oh wait, okay, I, I didn't know. Um, and anyway, but I think this is a good place mm -hmm. to, kind of in terms of the learning and unlearning mm -hmm. to like relearn and be like, okay. Um, and then I think we have, I guess our project and we can't spend too much time because we gotta get to the discussion, but I think kind of just one idea um, is that, so we, Yola and I started on this project and it really becomes about like like why is East Buffalo? And, and I always say East Buffalo is like, you can just stand in for East Columbus, it's a stand in for Baltimore. Why are these places, you know, that are, that are facing all this turmoil? I was just like, why are these places always seemingly black? And it just bothers me. And, and so we're like trying to figure out, well, should we talk about food deserts or a, a food apartheid or all these things? And like the one thing it was about how do we, how does one represent the, the, the body? Um, and I feel like our choice was to remove the body. And we had a long, you know, it's over dinners and drinks and it stayed late into the night. And I was like, you know, we, we had this really intense discussion, but we were like, yeah, we, we don't have to. And so I guess that's one of the questions we wanted to throw, not throw, but like place in your hands. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe we should, Yola, I'll give you the last mm -hmm. word. Oh yeah, I think you. I, I think you said said um just just about everything. I mean, the only kind of like related idea is that you know some of these things are like these are places you see, and and like I I'm interested in 
how visuality is is an entry point into a question, which I, I, I believe happens here, like the facades of these grocery stores were what we photographed, and then how you can be seeing like like the visible and the invisible at the same time. Like, you know, you see racism and then you but like do you see, you know, banking practices? How do you know how do you show those kinds of like all of those other currents, maybe some of which Azulai is talking talking about, but like, you know, racist colonial types of currents. So I, I, I for, for me, this was also a, a, a photo, like a kind of partly about like what, what, yeah, like, like you were saying with bodies, like what to reveal and what not to reveal. And really like this question about how do you show a system? How do you engage yeah. with systemic yeah. issues when you're working in this like very particularized kind of way? And that is perhaps as part of, you know, a, a like oh why why we went to audio like you know what why the why the project needs to be collaborative why it ends up taking this bigger uh kind of form um so yeah i guess we have um a couple of questions jared would you read the questions sure sure <laughs> yeah i don't know how this works but i so i don't know if we just read them and yeah and, if you don't and, mind yeah sure of course mm -hmm. uh so how does one represent the body of the disenfranchised. I mean, that's something, yeah. So that, that's one. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, we just go out and photograph. And like, are we allowed to do that? Um, I think we were talking about what the Russian woman who did the amazing work in Prospects Oh, Irina Rozovsky is a photographer. Maybe I should put her name in the chat it, box. It's less that, it's less that. Yeah. Is that just an example? of a work that we were talking about the other day that's so amazing but like well, what happens what does they say about this jesus going out photographing folks you don't know these people and they're out my, but it's like they're beautiful but maybe i respond um to yeah like the photo the photoness of them like in the how i used to do that it's like makes you want to you know take out the old medium take out the mamiya seven and go and like not be bothered um anyway but that that's that's a question are all documents depictions of violence? I think it's something that came up in the reading about documents. Um, mm. Yeah, so that's, I think we had one more. Uh, how, can we, how can we read photographs uh, for connection to indigenous culture, historical migrations, and other non-dominant identities? Mm. And then maybe this is the, like the notion of, of, of photographs as rep also repositories and of culture, like what you were uh, uh, saying about rent, you know, your connection with the renty photograph, or I, I had another photograph of a, a Hawaiian sacred site where it, it then becomes an act, a literal kind of document that you you know, people are using to reconstitute uh, um, traditional practices to say like, oh, this is how it was done. This is who we are, you know. Uh, um, so, so for for the kind of connection that that um, a photograph may provide to present culture. And the last one. <laughs> how can photography witness what is hard to see? I mean, that one just I don't know. Some of these, I think I had them before I went to grad school, like twelve years ago, and I have them now. Um, and I don't know, maybe they're not supposed to have a concrete answer, but I, I'm still curious. I think we're both curious. I mean, uh, you know, not mm -hmm. just, yeah. But so um, I don't know how, yeah, but those are the questions. May I stop my share? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. That was, um, those are amazing questions. They're so rich and it's hard to, um, well, they're obviously <laughs> very hard to answer. Um, I. I don't know. Does anybody just want to jump in and like start talking about these things? Because I'm happy to do that. But I also want to see if uh, anybody feels super motivated to just run with it. Hi, can I ask a question? Of course. Paulette. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, first off, um, just for Jared, I'm from northern Canada. Um, I'm living currently in Toronto. And we had those chairs all over Northern Canada. And considering mm -hmm. you've had to fly in all possessions, 
Um, yeah, those chairs were ultra chic in my community. <laughs> yeah. So it's, seriously, can I can't even lie. Like mm -hmm. I have so many pictures of me on that chair looking mighty fine. It was, it was the stand up chair. That's what you it did. Was, it like, it oh. was the chair that if you yeah. were gonna have a chic 1970s rumpus room, you needed that chair. Yeah. That chair brought the room together. <laughs> <laughs> but my question is, um, you've focused a lot on race and culture, which is great. Not arguing that whatsoever. My question is, is are you going to look at women in the history, like the historical relevance of women in photography, mostly that they were erased from the photographic canon, even though they were really, um, really forefront. And now you look at how a lot of male gaze is on women, like pretty much only naked women, like a lot of my Instagram feed is guys photographing mm -hmm. naked women and even women photographing naked women. Like there's none of that naked man in a photograph. And that's just, it's a huge consideration for me because it's like, I feel like we're leaving out a whole like race and culture aside. It's almost like photography split down the middle, men against women. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to take that? Um, that's a frustration that I <laughs> commonly feel. I was just complaining <laughs> to students. I was teaching a class on environmental, like a little mini course on on uh, sustainability and art. And then I, I was, you know, there's something about like, you know, the, the certain tropes came up and I had to mention that uh, uh, several sustainability activists I'm working with. If you go on their Instagrams, you will find photos of them in bikinis and like taken by themselves, by the way. And like, and then I, I think, why is this pain? Why is this painful? Like, why is this painful to witness that uh, that self presentation? I think one of the reasons I glommed on to that photograph from Renata Shirley's, and it was even in the poem, it's like, she's not wearing makeup. She doesn't, you know, do anything special to her hair. Um, that, that it was a kind of representation that made made me uh, uh, feel perhaps more empowered. So yeah, I, I completely um, hear Just it. Just as, yeah. as a historical, like my, fav my favorite and has been for ages, um, favorite historical photographer was Hannah Maynard from Victoria, just north of you. Mm. Um, she like, she did everything in camera. She actually took over her husband's photography business as he ran it into the ground she was a jailhouse photographer and it's just really interesting because no one ever talks about her it's the Maynard photography studio and they always relate everything done in that studio to him but it was actually her that did it all mm. so just just a comment just an idea thank you yeah, thank you. And, you know, we were talking about like, you know, or I mentioned the decolonizing the classics. I mean, I have like behind me when I started reading, because I, I think I think part of it is that the conversations like way beyond photography, I started reading the history of Western philosophy by Bertrand Russell. And I don't even think Hannah Arendt was in here. Um, and then and then there's like a very gracious thank you to his wife for all her help with notes taking you know so <laughs> that um so so yeah I, I also think one of the things too is uh photography like some of the conversations that are specific to photography are also conversations that go far beyond photography I will right. say I, I do think that it's important also like even with these uh types of presentations or if you notice like it's like we mostly introduce women photographers um and like the, the one, sorry, the one person who was naked was a, a man um, and in his self portraiture and his representation. But I do, you know, it's obviously in small ways, but I do feel like, mm -hmm. you know, like I think <laughs> there's some other people maybe we talked about. And in generally speaking, not everyone here, but I think a lot of us are educators. And it's like, it, it's like we have to make the effort to obviously include women, people of color, indigenous, everyone like a queer, like they need to be there. I think you can tell the history of photography through white men, but like why? And I like, we don't do that. And we like, 
I think we make a, you know, even our small presentation today, making a conscious effort to bring um, not new, obviously nothing's new about Carrie Mae Weems, but bring, you know, certain people to light. I think um, these questions are like super related to your three, the last three questions. Can you just go out and photograph are all documents, depictions of violence? How can photography witness what is hard to see? I, I mean, I see like the issue of representation of women, for instance, or uh, work by women um, integrated into these uh, questions um, because they are so, um, uh, like the idea of just going out and photographing, you know, like what are the questions that you have? You know, what, it, what is, who am I to, um, wh who am I uh, photographing? Who am I <laughs> depicting all those things? Um, uh, David, uh, did I cut you off? Sorry. No, I was gonna say, uh, Ji Hyun, I think I'm mm -hmm. saying your name, uh, has the hand raised. Do you wanna- oh, Jian. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi thank you for, hi, hi Liz, uh, hi everyone. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful like presentation, Yola and Jared. I just um had a I just started reading reading like Azule, so this might be really uh, <laughs> a very um early reader's question. Um, I just wanted to get your views as uh as practitioners of photography and also like teachers of photography and as critics, like whether Azule or Thomas Keenan, um, they're especially the readings that we did, like make you rethink the relationship between taking photographs and reading like photographs. It seems like the way that Azule, one of the, um, well, Azule has many things to say about like photographs, but the emphasis on like the photographic event and not just the photographs that are produced. I think at some point she also talks about not, I don't know if, I can't remember if she did it in these readings, but uh, she talks about untaken photographs mm -hmm. as well like in the larger photographic event. And uh, in Thomas Keenan's essay, it's very um, like the way that he talks about the imbrication of politics and the political moment, the, uh, not just politici politicization of photographs after the taking, but like all the politics that go into the creation of a photographic event made me really think about like photographs at, as not just products, but like as part of something larger. And I wonder if, um, it's like they make you think about the relationship between like taking photographs and reading, reading them like a little differently. Because I think in, in a lot of the art history classes, for example, like the emphasis is, is more on like formalistic, like re formalist readings of individual photographs. So I just wanted to get your uh, view on that. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. I'll maybe I'll st start off. I I really love that question, and and when I mentioned that I had been uh, started following Azule a little bit earlier, I I actually thought that 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 idea of the the photographic event was a, you know as a political situation was a really uh, powerful to me because of yeah the idea that like even you know it, no there no photograph may be taken at that moment, but there's still an event and you know when I like my I mentioned my background in photojournalism like I worked in the M Middle East as as a uh, press photographer and I was also shot on the job as a photographer like that was my wounding uh you know a long time ago now to, uh, 20 years ago was was a kind of photographic event so i felt very much like oh you know this idea of like how we are all implicated like it, it is it, it is such an important part of the conversation and especially like the experiences of the people like this is maybe another way um about uh, to answer the question of gender, like when someone is being looked at, and maybe I didn't say that when I was showing the pictures of the uh, the picture with the hula dancers, but like when someone is being looked at, like their perspective or their experience, their presence, their being as part of that event, I think like is, is incredibly important and maybe part of the way that the conversation, like I, I think now it's sort of, I mean, like, you know, when I, when I go to artists 
talks or you know like like see photographic work being presented uh, ra like rarely does one encounter the formalist reading anywhere where you're just saying like here's the artist and the artist made this without taking somehow accounting for like the the full complexity of the situation and the the role of the subject and even I mean this is like a little kind of a, a slightly geeky art note but I'm into Joseph Boyce's idea of every, like everyone is an artist and you know it's part of uh, my interest in vernacular photographs too but this idea that like the participants I mean I think maybe Jared and I uh, differ on this but this idea that the participant is also an artist in some kind of way. Um, does Jared want to? Oh, go ahead, David. Oh, there's some more people with their hands up. Yeah. So I was going to go for it. Long, unless you wanted to also respond, Jared. No, that's fine. Yeah, I can answer. I mean, did it, the answer to the question? No, I don't think it really. But I feel like a lot of these ideas weren't radically new um, for me. Uh, I, I, I found the Keenan, I, I found that I had to. Generally speaking, when it comes to theorists, I tend not to read uh, like white male theorists. So it was like for an assignment and like, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I was like, okay, this feels a little bit like, okay, I like Sekula, like I can get down. Um, but it made me back, back, to, back to my grad school days where I feel like things were shoved down my throat. And I, yeah, and so I had a little flashback, but no, I don't think it, it didn't change too much for me, uh, but we should probably get to the next question. And maybe uh, so, so Gay, Gay can ask and then Zora can follow up um, with the questions. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this forum. Um, it's just really a comment to Yola. Um, I think that um, like when we try to find examples of other histories, I think often examples are also from a different kinds of power relationships or hegemony. So, so I want to offer the suggestions instead of comparing Queen Lulio Kalani to uh, Douglas, who was a escaped slave, like Queen was super elite, that another figure that might be better is Ko'olau the leper, um, who, who the um, Hawaiian government, soon after it was um, like colonized or taken over, uh, there was a breakout of leprosy and the, the lepers were forcibly removed from their family um, to a different island in an isolated region. And Ko allowed the leper shot the sheriff, the sheriff who was in charge. Uh, so he had to escape. And there was a very dramatic history and story about him. So there are not too many photographs, certainly not in a dignified way that the queen would have done. Um, so I want to suggest that. And also that the queen had, a, uh, the Roy Hawaiian royalty had many photographs that made of themselves that would emulate other kinds of dignitaries around the world. And they would travel a lot. They, um, some of them built like botanical gardens, like very much like the, uh, mm -hmm. like traveling the world, taking specimens from, from different regions. So I, I think that it's, I try to avoid um, com using the elites to, to try and represent, you know, communities of color. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think I was thinking the relationship to Frederick, I, I, Frederick Douglass as kind of elite political figure and intellectual and, but of course, yeah, the background is, it, it, it's all, it's almost like a, um, I, I mean, he has two characters who have, you know, these like very, very dramatic arcs um, to to their lives. But um, yeah, maybe is, is, but but it, yeah, your your point is absolutely well taken. And I will. I'm not familiar with Kalau the leper, but I'll 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 follow up with you, and and I'll I'll look for it as well. Jared, do you have a do you have any thoughts about this too? you know, in terms of the comparison? I mean, everything that they said, I was just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that makes Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just in the, the amen. Oh, yeah, no, it yeah, was a great yeah. call. Thank you. Zora, do you want to jump in? <laughs> Thank you, Gay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I really enjoy the, uh, like, how you um, talk about, like, the, or, like, the Azulay quote, you know, about 
the history of photography beginning, you know, in, in 1492. Um, and I, I wonder, like, you know, I'm, I'm a photographer, you know, I go out, I've, you know, made work where I go out into the world and I, you know, photograph, um, you know, other people and, you know, places that I'm not from. Um, and so I think a lot about representation, but I, I also wonder, like, when do we begin speaking more about the non-positionality of whiteness? You know, like how white photographers don't have to account mm -hmm. for, you know, going out into the world and photographing, you know, being, um, you know, a black photographer, uh, you know, my experience in grad school was one where I always had to sort of defend my position about what it was that I was making and like defend my position through like solely the lens of race and that like I'm supposed to account, be able to account for all of these very particular things while watching, you know, my white peers never be asked those questions. And so I wonder like, you know, how do we begin maybe interrogating whiteness more directly when it when we talk about, um, you know, sort of, you know, the history of photography, the practice of photography, the ethics, um, all of those things. Um, Zora, may I follow up? Like, do you have, um, is there anything, I, I mean, it's obviously an amazing question, but is there anything that you, um, I, mean, I went to your talk, so maybe you've already answered it, but in terms of where, where you see that interrogation beginning or how, how you see it being taken up? I mean, like to be like simple about it, you know, I'm gonna show up at a white artist talk and be like, you know, like, how do you talk about your work through the lens of whiteness? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, because it's, you know, that's often a, a question that gets posed to me. Um, and then I, an expectation that I have to be able to like answer on behalf of, of black mm -hmm. people. And even like, you know, kind of having this experience, um, you know, in the not so recent past, um, you know, like on uh, like a, a photographer friend posted, you know, like the work of um, a black artist and was like, you know, like saying like, you know, congratulations on this thing or whatever. And then somebody in the comments was like, well, like it would be great if, you know, there were black artists who didn't like talk about blackness. And so it's just like this weird kind of like loop or cycle that we seem to get stuck in that, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of getting mm -hmm. lost in that answer, but um, hopefully that provides a bit more clarity. Can I j um, jump in? Because, you know, one of the things I was thinking about that I think if I can maybe try to tie some of these points together. Uh, one to, to one of your first questions, you know, where, where um, you asked, like, may I just go out and photograph? Um, and I think the answer pretty definitively from kind of what I'm hearing from everyone and is all, all these texts is, is a pretty resounding no. Um, in the sense like, you know, you may not, you know, if your project is interested in decoloni decolonization and decol decolonizing photography, like you may not go out and photograph thoughtlessly, right? Like you are accountable to an enormous amount of, of history and context with the images you make. And I think some of the message here is like, we are holding, you know, we are holding artists accountable for these images they make. And, and so then my next question is thinking about Azuli especially, which is like, you know, I think a lot of what we're thinking about is like, well, what is a decolonized image? And, and I, I sort of feel like you presented two options that, that I've been thinking about a lot. And, you know, one is that Frederick Douglass, right? A kind of a corrective to a narrative which is like, you think about this type of person in one way, and I am presenting a different image that, that runs counter to the one you are aware of, um, or a, a document of a kind of wickedness, right? Like those um, capital riots or, um, uh, what was the other one? The, the, the protest image, right? That sort of mm -hmm. is a document of a moment of grace and a moment of wickedness kind of mm -hmm. coming together. And, and then I think, uh, and this I think I've talked about Zora a lot as well, is, is the kind of third way, which is like the, the redlining issues, like, and then how do you photograph a thing 
that is that is more or less invisible, right? A sort of a systemic um, a systemic force that is is kind of oppressive and and kind of keeps that kind of imperialistic mentality over a population. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess that's more of like what I'm coming, how I'm processing those questions you're asking so far. Um, and and I guess you know does I guess does that does, does you know does some of those kind of modes of photographing seem I guess to the to the artists on the panel to seem more relevant or or more potent in this project than others? Yeah, I guess I'll I'll, I'll say something like it, it's tough. Like I guess we we asked that question. We kind of started out with the idea that we agreed with Azalea's premise, but. You know, I just think the things that prevent you from making, I don't know, as an artist, just go make the stuff. Like, my, my, like obviously in front of here, and I'd have like a more nuanced answer. But if I was talking to Zora, I'd just be like, do whatever you want, brother, like do it. And like one, I should also say, I actually really like Zora's work. I actually teach it in, in my classes. Um, uh, Cause there are, I think there is a dearth of, of people Black people, especially the people of color, who want to like use like different various like medium formats of film. I think the work is nuanced. I always go for me. It always goes back to Tina Barney. I show a lot of Tina Barney's work, and I ask people what it's about, and I always and there's like no. I was like, how did anyone not say it's about whiteness? If this was black folks in front of paintings, and all be oh about the black, and it's like no, this is about whiteness. A certain type of whiteness is about class, and then it's like, and then everyone's like, oh yeah, it's like we got to talk about it. We got it's like no need, we don't need to hide these things. These things are in the images, literally. Coco, so oh I, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'll just say no. I, I just think that there's an, like I feel like like this like the, is always angst where it's like, well, what can I do? And it's like, I just feel like for the artist in me, it's like, man, you do whatever you want. They don't tell white people what they, yeah, white people do whatever they want. <laughs> Shoot, do whatever you want. And, and like, he's talented, so it's going to be great. And it's going to be done with like grace. And it's going to be done with, with like a, the decolonial mindset. And so like, just don't get caught up in all, like all the theory. And I think sometimes theory can like hold artists back. Sorry, were you gonna say Yola? I was just gonna say that uh, Coco Fusco, I t had a book called um, uh, "Shoot Only Skin Deep" uh, that came out uh, in like the early two thousands, and there was an exhibition at the ICP. But she, I mean, I, I didn't see the exhibition, uh, but I had her for for a class. Um, was you know she was like the first person I heard. Um, actively engaging with whiteness in photography and Tina Barney, you know, it, yeah, of course, is, her work is the prime is the prime example, you know, and then you can trace even the lineage between that kind of work. And then also like advertising photography, where you see whiteness being reproduced all the time and like, you know, and codes of dress and then of course then it gets complicated with like appropriative you know the flow flow of appropriative practices in fashion um but uh but yeah i i mean i i do think it's true that that uh that conversation is like not uh, about how whiteness functions is is not as foregrounded like you know uh, like this is something we know that like you, you introduce uh, some someone a person of color gets introduced as a person of color or a person not of color gets introduced as a person and 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 so that that maybe this is you know in teaching the critical lens that you know like I you know I happen to be particularly obsessed with class I mention it ever like whenever I show any kind of work I I always perform a kind of analysis about um I try to about how things are functioning at, at that level I don't know it, but Zora, I really like your question that you posed, which is that, how do you talk about your work through the lens of whiteness? Thank you for that. It also reminds me of um, Jian's question, the taking versus reading of photographs. Mm -hmm. um, and I so appreciate your comment, um, Jared, of how uh, even though um, Azule's arguments ring true to us, it can be very stifling um, uh, as a maker. But that I think is 
a testament to the great difficult task that we are contending with is how do we um, actually uh, decolonize our minds, our eyes, and how do we actually um, find a, a, a way to, as you put it in your um, last question, uh, witness what is hard to see. Um, yeah. And, oh, Sorry. Go Where you no, I, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I think I think you bring us <laughs> some really good points, and I think about what you said, and then what Yola said about like. I think it's just obviously some of it's just different. Like I love being introduced as black because I am, and I love it. And so it's just like that's me, and you know, like so I I, I take pride in that. But I also think, like I said, I think it's almost irresponsible if you don't bring up issues of class. Mm -hmm. Like that, that to me, so it's like, well, this person's not even real. He just living in a fantasy mm -hmm. world. And they want to bring up mm -hmm. fantasy things. Okay, let them, you know. But so I think that's great that you bring that up, Yola. Um, and then I guess, I guess getting back to uh, what Liz was saying is that like, I, I think even with the, the work in uh, Red Lighting Buffalo, like I think it's challenging, right? Like I, I, I'm, very, you know, fortunate. I live in Columbus. I'm a professor. And it's like, what on some level do I have in common with folks in East Buffalo? And it's like, on some level, not a lot. Um, but like, there's like this intersectionality, I think, amongst race and amongst the fact that obviously I didn't always, wasn't always a professor. And it's like, and then you, you just, it, it really like, like it hurts my heart. Like, I remember when we, the first day we were in East Buffalo, and then we went to the uh, uh, to that uh, pizza place. Uh, the hydraulic curve. Yeah, and all of a sudden, it was <laughs> like we were still in East Buffalo, but like I didn't see any black people, but it was a nice part of East Buffalo, and I was like, I can't, this is too much. And it's just like, I don't know, I think, so, so sometimes I'm like, do I even belong? Like, what is my role in this? I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not above all this. I, you know, there's some criticism there, but I'm like, make the work, mm -hmm. make the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like, you know, the, the part of the genesis of the project, I mean, you know, when, when I when I first came to Buffalo, I thought, like, you know, it just it just seems so striking to me that, uh, um, you know, and Liz, I know we talked about this when, when when we first met that, like, you know, the this, uh, the, the, it's always, you know, often quoted and I, I the statistic of like Buffalo is the third most segregated city in America. America, but it's so uh, it, it just seems so like incredibly clear cut and so visible this this map that that exists this economic map um, you know the the like you read the median income and in Buffalo family income is thirty three thousand dollars for a family but of but then but then it's like <laughs> the median is like much high, uh, way lower on, on, on one side and higher on the other. And I did see, you know, my frustration was like, cause I'm like, well, who am I? Like, I just moved to Buffalo in 2016. Like what, you know, what is, what is my role here? I teach at, you know, a, a college, you know, on, on, on the West side of Buffalo. Um, but uh, these are things that somehow like aren't, you be, like they're uncomfortable to un address. Um, and and I mean I do take to heart like the the kind of the challenges like well uh, this question of like well should we be looking at systemic racism through the lens of like looking at poverty should we also be looking at like the you know the structures that uphold privilege you know I think that's like a, you know n another question you can do both I see a hand up from HD Hi. <laughs> um, so I, because I, I have a question about the Zeely daguerreotypes, because I, I guess we're going to, I'm taking us a little bit off course, mm -hmm. but I thought it was interesting that um, uh, in terms of Carrie May Weems' work, we um, used the kitchen series as an example, and having Rinty's image up, immediately I, I thought of Carrie May Weems' work with that, um, with that archive. Um, but also in terms of how her work um, stirred up such a controversy and, and ideas of what was legal. So there's like a, um, an image legal argument um, that has culminated in you know, a, a book that was just published about 
sort of the, um, the deep history behind those images. And in terms of thinking about um, uh, Azalea, um, uh, who I love, and I've, I've never personally felt constrained. I'm, I'm a photographer. I'm also an educator and practicing artist. I've never felt constrained by her work. Mm -hmm. I've felt actually that she's put a theory behind what I've been making mm -hmm. um, in terms of thinking about how, 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 are, how is society structured in a way that, um, that influences how we read photographs and that how society was structured predates the invention of the machine. And so um, I think how she talks about shutters and, and even using the, the data of 1492, which I think is kind of arbitrary, but, but a way of, of setting us way, way back in history at a time that was very much rife with colonialism and imperialism and, and these, these divides of these arbitrary borders. Um, and so in thinking about, I don't know if, if you guys agree with that, but that's sort of what I take, have been taking from her theory. Um, and I was really interested in, in how that would apply to how Carrie Mae Weems worked with that archive and, and sort of that whole controversy and, and, why, and, and why there was such an uproar about it and sort of the story behind, um, I don't know if you wanna call it repatriation of those images, but sort of the reclaiming of them and the reviewing of them in this new context um, outside of them being these face or these nameless slaves. So I don't know, there's no question that I just went, went to reactions to that, so, yeah. Um, well, so you're speaking about the series, the uh, the Carrie Mae Weems series from here, I saw what happened and I cried, right? Do you, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's worth like <laughs> looking at it together. Um, uh, yeah, Jared, you, you wanna take it first? I need yeah, to yeah, formulate no, I mean, an answer. My guess the controversy becomes because there are pieces that are in the public. And on some level, I assume she makes money off of these. I think if this was a personal practice, um, I wonder if it would have the uproar. Um, but I guess I also want to say that I, I agree with everything you said. I thought it was like, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that would, yeah, HD is right. Um, my other thought is I always, I'm always like, shoot, like, I want to like put your website. I want to see more of your images. <laughs> um, that's selfishly. Uh, but if you're thinking about these things, I was like, oh man, that's someone who's making images that I'm probably interested in. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess my, that'd be my guess is that I think it's an uproar because it's like somebody's likeness. I think it's like pain and like they're making, she's making money off of someone else's likeness and someone else's pain. Well, I'll just say that the controversy mostly was Harvard suing Carrie Mae Weems over the use of the images because they claimed them as their own. And yeah. um, they, stuff. they want to they they cut. Her. I bet yeah, you, but, you, yeah, I bet yeah. you they're like, Carrie was like, I'll give you a cut. They would have shut up. No, but there's it, a there's a coda to the story, which is that ultimately Harvard ended up buying her work. Like, I mean, that's what I, what I the story is I remember is that um, Harvard sued her, but then the narrative, you know, it might be an example of a narrative tide changing because then they were like, wait a minute, this is like incredibly valuable this kind of yeah like the act of of reinterpretation is a valuable act or you know these uh yeah so now they're part i don't know if they're part of the same library archive but now carrie may weems's work is part of the harvard library archive so it's a kind of um yeah i mean maybe i don't know if that addresses some like the the the, the notion of the canon or the positionality of the institution because like you know we're living in a time in which all like so all these institutions are tripping over themselves to be more decolonial to address their racist pasts and maybe there's like another thing in there which is like what is the facade of that action versus the substance of that action and what really would the substance of that action mean if you know if you took it to to its logical conclusion but it is like a kind of a powerful moment, I think, for, for Carrie Mae Weems' work. And you might even say, I mean, I, I wonder what Azule would say, but I would imagine her argument was partially influenced by Carrie Mae Weems. My first thought is that I'm curious, like, if there is a shift, why there was a shift from Harvard's end. And I start thinking about, like, 
just the diversity of like board members like was there a woman was there a person of color who was just like what you guys are doing no we're not doing that and not only are we not doing that we're gonna buy the work um like it seems like such a dramatic shift to you know to be suing someone and then all of a sudden be like our bad and publicly we actually want to that's that's yeah this is i was just curious about that but no i think what yola said was great thank you yeah mm -hmm. It also um, reminds me of the part where Azule is talking about not just photographs, but objects and museums too. Mm. And, you know, at some, I don't remember if it was in the two articles we read mm -hmm. or in the yeah, book. Yeah, it was but, in the second one. Um, like she, for instance, talks about how like, uh, you know, restitution or repatriation, like if we think that returning the object will solve the problem like we're totally wrong like it does not undo the violence that is taken at the moment the shutter releases um so it's but i i do think that this this parallel that um she is drawing from um the world of images and the right she talks about the imperial right to possess mm -hmm. to know um to take the photograph in the same way you take an object from one setting to place it in the context of a museum. And as a museum professional, mm -hmm. I struggle all the time with this um, in the same way that Jared uh, talks about how in theory, yeah, totally, 100%, but like, what, do, what, what am I supposed to do? You know, mm -hmm. um, of course there are, uh, this is a struggle that you have to have and you would be irresponsible if you don't have this struggle. Um, but I do think about it a lot, like the, it feels like um, uh, a restrictive bind that you're in. Like, and how do I, what voices do I attend to? What truths do I want in this context? One of um, the people we interviewed for the audio segment of Redlining Buffalo was um, an urban studies professor. And actually, I think you first uh, uh, mentioned his name to me, Liz, um, Henry Lewis Taylor. Um, but he had, a, there, there was a very interesting moment when he was speaking about um, the valuation of uh, land being tied to whiteness. Because I think like this whole time that we've been preparing this, I, I've been having in my mind like the kind of question about photographic images, but the kind of parallel question about, you know, now there's the thing about, you know, the game stop shares, like, you know, value, value as a construct, right? And so like certain, you know, when you think is anyway, so, so in Henry Lewis Taylor, it's like, you know, the exclusivity of white neighborhoods gives that land more value compared to other land, right? this kind of like artificial you know bank driven construction of value and so then I was thinking about how does that apply to uh you know to um artwork of course like how how are you know how is our uh, like val you know value created and depleted by institutional spaces and of course there's that whole other narrative about like other non-capitalist forms of value like you know the value of something to a culture versus this kind of like status the institutional status of it um, yeah, so uh, I don't know that that's a kind of uh, uh, maybe in interesting question about yeah the uh, like institutional role of um, like li like treating you know gi giving giving cer cer like this idea of uh, you know thing things that might otherwise be priceless be being given a price and a particular um, role capitalist role to play. Jared. Um. Yeah, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I, I yeah, I didn't, I didn't disagree. So yeah. I, okay, uh, all right. Anyway, Henry Lewis Taylor, check check him out. Yeah, well, it's a he's also like not just like an urban studies professor; he's the director oh, of yep. uh, urban, I think, the institute there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but no, I think you're yeah. I, was there a question that I missed? But I thought yeah, your no, analysis no. was spot on. Yeah. Uh, I know we're coming up to se seven mm -hmm. o'clock. I feel like the session just flew right by mm -hmm. because we were all talking and having a great conversation. Um, 
uh, unless there are any like last minute burning questions, comments, anybody wants to throw in, I can um, make some announcements for the next session. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, uh, next session is being held um, March 9th, uh, Tuesday again, 530 uh, with Sarah Greenberger Rafferty and Shannon Ebner. Um, here, I'll drop the event link uh, in the chat. Um, and I have to say, so for, for the next week, um, the reading that we're going to do is brand new, as in like it just uh, got published as part of um, the uh, pro, uh, photo programs imprint Pound Per Image, which is a great title. Um, so you, we will be actually emailing that out as a PDF. So look out for um, our email from Maria and um, we will be uh, engaging in a conversation with Sarah and Shannon who actually are the um, original uh, inspirants, uh, the, the inspiration behind this whole thinking through photograph um, packet that I put together. They organized this great symposium called um, Teaching Photographs at Pratt in October 2019 um, and uh, it was based on their hard work and research and compilation of so many interesting resources that um, uh, myself and my GA at the time, Hope Mora, put together thinking through photographs. So I am super excited to have them um, come visit us and to lead our next uh, topic uh, discussion, which is how do photographs teach? Um, I'm sure it's a pertinent discussion to many of us um, here. Uh, and yeah, we'll, um, we look forward to seeing you and help spread the word to other people that you might think uh, would like to join us. Um, otherwise, uh, Jared, do you want to talk about the show <laughs> that you're in? Am I putting oh, you on no. the spot? I definitely do not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, any other uh, announcements, David, that you want to make? Um, for those of you Pittsburghers, um, Silver and I will have a new show opening next week. We hope we'll be open by appointment again, you know, pandemic, as long as it kind of continues to relent a little bit. Um, so you can make an appointment to see the Keystone Prize winners of our fellowship and honorable mentions. And those are um, a couple of wonderful photographers from across the great state of Pennsylvania as chosen by um, former TTP facilitator, Dan Lears. So that'll be a really nice thing. And I'll just plug Jared's work. It's at the <laughs> West Virginia University Art Gallery. It's a, a series of photographs we showed at Silver Eye a couple of years ago of uh, every Planned Parenthood in Ohio. And they're, I think, actually really pertinent to this discussion um, in, in many ways. And it's just a really brilliant series of photographs. So if you find yourself in West Virginia, you should visit the WBU Museum. Sounds Thanks. good. Thank you. Emily, am I forgetting any announcements from UB Art Galleries? Okay. I think so. <laughs> yeah, we're also open for um, in-person visits by appointment. So uh, come pay us a visit too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, on that note, thank you, everybody. We will see you March 9th. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.